Hi, this is Bart Polson. This video is for Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences, and in it, we're looking at the four online quizzes for Chapter 8, which is about hypothesis testing. In this video, we look at Quiz 1. The first question on this quiz is, the z-test is appropriate when a, the researcher needs to estimate the population variance or standard deviation, b, the researcher knows the population mean and variance or standard deviation, c, the data consists of nominal variables, or d, the data distribution is symmetrical. The answer to this one is B. To do the z-test, the researcher needs to know the population mean and the variance or standard deviation. You can tell that from the formula that we have right here. It's simply a z-score, and we have the uh, sample mean on the top, which we get from the sample data, but from that we have to subtract the population mean, because we're getting the deviation between the sample mean and the population mean. So that's one piece of information you need to have, and by the way, that's something that you need to be given, that you have to know already before you do the study. Beneath that is the standard error. You see that sigma sub x bar, and what that is, is it's based on the population standard deviation. So, in order to do the z-square, you have to already know this information about the population. Next question. If a researcher wants to test whether an experimental group is different from the general population, then she would test a, the null hypothesis of no difference between the group and the population. B, the hypothesis that the experimental group has a higher score than the population. C, the hypothesis that the experimental group has a lower score than the population. Or D, whether her sample was representative. Well, the answer in this one is A, the null hypothesis of no difference between the group and the population. The reason for this is that it's, we're doing what's called null hypothesis significance testing and we're we test the null, we test sort of the opposite of what we want to see if we have data that seems to be an exception to it. Um, this is because it's very hard to prove, for instance, that uh, these differences are the rule, um, those are in B and C. It's very hard to prove those things, but it's much easier to prove that there's an exception to things than it is to prove that there are no exceptions. And here's what it looks like, by the way. Uh, what we have is the null hypothesis in red. Now note that it's written in Greek letters because it's about population means. And what it says here is that the population mean for the sample, that's why it has subscript S, is equal to the population mean for the comparison group, that's the subscript C. The, alter the alternative hypothesis is simply that they are not equal. And uh, on the right we have the... Um, the null distribution, which shows the range of possible values, assuming that the null hypothesis of no difference is true, and we've sectioned off uh, the part on the far right and the far left as being possible in the null distribution, but unlikely to occur. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. The third question, in a two-tailed or non-directional test, if the critical value has a greater absolute value than the observed or test value does, then the null hypothesis, dot, 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 A is rejected, B must be replaced with a one-tailed or directional hypothesis, C is not rejected, that is retained, or D is proven false. So I, this is a confusing question, and the reason I included it this way is because there are questions very similar to this on the departmental final, so you need to be able to work through the logic of what exactly is being asked for. The answer in this particular case is that if the critical value has a greater value than the observed test value, so the test, the observed value is less than the critical value, then the hypothesis is not rejected. The null hypothesis is not rejected. So here's an example of it. Um, the, uh, the curve here shows the null hypothesis distribution, and this is again the range of possible values uh, assuming the null hypothesis is true, and that variation is due to uh, random sampling error. And what we have here are critical values. That's where the yellow regions start because we've uh, cut off the top part of the distribution and the bottom part. And those vertical lines that separate the yellow from the white, those are the critical values. And our observed or test value is the red X that's on the uh, bottom axis. And you can see that it's close to one of the cutoffs, but it's on the inside. It has a lower value. And by value here, we're, we're talking about a one sample uh, z-score test, a z-test, and so the z-score for the sample would be, for instance, 1.7, which is less than the critical value for a standard um, two-tailed alpha of 0.5 test of 
plus or minus a z squared plus or minus 1.96. So it's it's got a lower absolute value. It's with it's closer to the middle, and so we do not have evidence of a substantial deviation from the mean. All right, number four, when calculating an effect size for the z-test, A, the sample size is irrelevant, B, you must use the population standard error, C, you must first check for homogeneity of variance, or D, the alpha values must be incorporated. The answer to this one is A, the sample size is irrelevant. Um, let's take a quick look at the formula here. The most common measure of effect size for the z-test is Cohen's d, and that's what I have here on the left. So d is equal to the difference between the sample mean and the population mean, fine, divided by the population standard deviation sigma. Now compare this to the z-score that's on the right side, where you have the same stuff in the numerator on the top, but in the bottom, instead of just being sigma, it's, it's the standard error, sigma sub x bar which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And that's the major difference between Cohen's d and the z-score, is the fact that Cohen's d is not affected by sample size, at least in terms of how it treats the standard deviation. Number five, what does it mean when the result of a z-test is called statistically significant? That's an important question. A, the alternate hypothesis has been proven true. B, the null hypothesis has been proven false. C, the alpha value was greater than the p-value. Or D, the results can be generalized to other populations. The answer here is C, the alpha value was greater than the p-value. Now, that's not necessarily the first thing I would think of, but of these four choices, it's the only one that's accurate. Uh, let me mention very quickly, A and B are not accurate because we're dealing with a probabilistic exercise. There's imprecise measurement. There's always the possibility of error or exceptions. And so it's usually, you don't want to talk about proving anything wrong or proving anything true, because you can really only do that if you have something that's absolutely guaranteed to happen 100% of the time and you find an exception to it. And that just doesn't happen in the behavioral sciences. Also, D, the results can be generalized to other populations. That has more to do with how you gathered your sample data, not with whether the results are statistically significant. Uh, but let's take a quick look at, at what it's like. So the alpha value has to do with the region that's on the outside. So for instance, in this one on the left, you see that we have um, the middle part in sort of this uh, maroon color, and that we have the tails are in white. and on the one on the right, you see we've got this white middle part and we have the tails in yellow. Now, the alpha value is the value that you choose ahead of time as determining what is your cutoff, what's too big or what's too small. And, and see, for your, in the yellow one, we, we've got these lines set off. And um, those are probably supposed to represent the top 2.5% and the bottom 2.5%, which gives you the standard 5% um, non-directional test. And so the alpha value is the, is the total proportion of the distribution that's in these extreme ends, and it's usually 5%. Now, in the one on the left, you can see that the white area, it says right there, is 16%. The um, observed p-value has to do with the statistic itself. Now, in the uh, picture on the right, you see the red x. It's in the critical region. Um, and so you, the p-value says what percentage of the distribution is at least as far away from the mean as that is, and it'd be going in either direction. And you can tell because it's farther away than the critical values, that's going to be a smaller area. So for instance, we can go back to the one on the left and we can say what percent of the distribution is at least 1.4 uh, z-scores away from the mean? And the answer is 16%. Now, if we're using the standard alpha value of 0.5, which is 5%, 16% is much bigger, and um, that's not statistically significant. We do not reject the null hypothesis. We retain it. But in the one on the right, our little red X is in the critical region. It's more extreme. It's farther away, and it has a lower p-value than the alpha value. Anyhow, that's it for the first quiz, and I'll see you for the second one.